All right. So uh, welcome, Mark. It's uh, good to see you again. Oh, we'll unmute you. There we are. Has to there unmute. you are. You got to oh. hit the little. Oh, I think I hit it at the same time as you. I'm sorry. Hit unmute one more time. Got it. There you go. There Perfect. We are. <laughs> um, yeah. So well, I, when I saw you, it was the spring. We were just getting the the seeing the fruitlets. So how did the season turn out? It, it was the, the best fruit year ever, uh, 2021. Uh, still have uh, the 600 pounds of apples in the cooler. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, but, but it was also my first year as the fruit manager. And, 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 and I, you know, definitely there's need for improvement uh, in, in my skill. But because it was such a, a plentiful year, um, even with my losses, I still had enough that I was uh, scrambling to, uh, to sell it all. And, and, and if I had taken good care of everything, I would have been out of my mind trying to move it all. Uh, so, so it was great. It was great. It was a gift. It may have been a gift, beginner's luck, uh, weather-wise. You know, we, we had dryness in the spring, and that's huge. Cool. Um, so we've, uh, I, I guess I have your uh, slideshow presentation. Um, I guess we're going to jump right into it because everybody wants to ask questions. You know, that's, uh, that's the best part of this is they get yeah. to ask you about your knowledge base. So if, so, if you're, yeah. if you're ready, I'll, I'll bring that up and then you can kind of uh, be, narrate us through it. Uh, but the should we save the questions for the end or do? Oh them as yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we're going to go into your PowerPoint now. Yeah, and then at the end of the PowerPoint, then let everybody get to asking you some good stuff. Uh, you know, I'll try and move through it to save time. Okay, appreciate it. Let me uh, get this going. I'm going to do a screen share. I'll ask the first one while Tony's getting that set up. Do you have something specific for brown rot of plums, and was it successful? Yeah, I, I I didn't I didn't put enough of it on. Okay. Uh, I, and I had it. I had it. And and it but it speaks to one of the challenges keeping up with the workload is uh, significant in fruit. It is significant. And what was that spray? The uh, it's a sulfur spray. Okay. Microtherial disperse. Okay. All right. Well, uh, looks like Tony's got your PowerPoint ready, so we'll let you go with that. Okay. And we've got our audience. We do oh, have yeah. quite an audience. <laughs> okay. Sure. All right. Okay. Mark Canwright here, organic orchardist. Uh, in a half an hour, we're going to uh, try and cover a lot of how to. We're going to, well, I'm going to focus on the principal challenges you will face in organic orcharding and have to skip over some detail. Uh, but uh, my story started in the 70s with um, uh, my dad's organic farm. Uh, we had some ancient trees that I was a hungry teenager and I, was, I tried to get them producing. Uh, never did really succeed, but a, a seed was planted in, in, in my desire for fruit. Uh, 2003, bought a 40 acre farm in Hunterdon County. Uh, drunk with land out of my mind, the perfect thing to do. If you have spare land, fruit is, is one way to burn up some acres. But, but, so your principal challenges that you will face, starting with, should you grow organic fruit? Um, it is more difficult and unforgiving than organic vegetable. Um, if, if your farm was walking a financial tightrope, I would say don't go heavily into organic tree fruits. You know, organic tomatoes at $4 a pound is hard to beat. Um, and, but, but if you are a backyard fruit grower potentially, or, or your, your commercial operation, uh, starting on a small scale, I say, go for it. It, it is doable. High quality or uh, cosmetic um, organic fruit is, is achievable. 
it, you know, it, it takes some work. Um, so, so you should, we're, first we're gonna start with, uh, next we'll start with what to plant. Uh, yes, and disease resistance should be your guide in, uh, in what you choose. And, and most fruits, uh, apple, pear, peach, um, that you look through the offerings, you Google for disease resistance because there are varieties that have more. And so that right from day one, there's some big problems that are off your job list. Asian pears, uh, in terms of ease of getting a sellable crop, um, pest and disease issues, insect and disease issues, uh, making Asian pears maybe the easiest to grow. They have the added virtue that uh, they're fast growing, that you can be picking some in as little as three years. They are juicy, crunchy, and sweet that, um, that it, took, it took several years, but my farmer's market customers now want them. You know, there, there's still people who walk up and say, what is it? But uh, the key, one of the keys to Asian pear, they must be left hanging on the tree to the moment of perfect ripeness. If you pick them early, they will not ripen off the tree. And it's why you'll never taste a good Asian pear in the grocery store. They, you know, the, the, the commercial fruit industry just by reflex picks too early. And, and in the case of Asian pears, they never get better. And uh, uh, varieties, varieties. My, my pick, Shinseki, on the right there uh, for disease resistance and flavor. Um, uh, that, I mean, they all taste good. Shintiki, Shinsiki tastes better than that. Korean giant, unique, primarily because you can get these huge um, uh, Asian pears. Um, in Japan, they pay uh, astronomical amounts of money for a single pear if it's big enough and beautiful enough. Um, but yeah, Shinseki, there's, there's a whole other, yes, European pear. Also high on the list of easier to grow. Um, pest and disease issues, not so much. You know, your uncle had an old tree in his backyard. He never took care of it. And there were pears all over the place. These are the last three pears from my cooler. They're looking a little rough, but they are, again, they are modern disease resistant varieties. On the top, uh, Potomac, the green ones, Potomac. Uh, there was a single brownish one, Shenandoah. Shenandoah has the virtue of disease resistance fast growth, as fast as Asian pears, and it's the best tasting pear I've ever eaten. Uh, the, you know, the old saying is plant pears for your heirs because they're slow to come into production. Uh, both of these didn't seem to have that. They do things, modern varieties, of heavy fruit set. You know, they're dependable. Next slide. In apples, the king of disease resistance, enterprise, re resistant to multiple diseases, more so than any other apple. Uh, it has that uh, tart sweet flavor, a little bit like wine sap. Uh, it stores well, I still have um, at least 400 pounds of enterprise in my cooler. Uh, the apple on the left has not been washed. The apple on the right has been washed. They're both enterprise. And you could sell that one on the left, even in its unwashed state. This is a great virtue in apples. You know, you're in a rush to go to the farmer's market and, uh, and you, you didn't wash them in advance and so forth. And, and this apple doesn't, we are gonna, we're gonna look at other apples that have what is called sooty blotch and it's a big problem. Next slide. Liberty, the, uh, one of the other old standbys in disease resistance has the virtue, it ripens in September. You, you know, the sooner the better for the, for the harvest to begin. 
uh, Enterprise ripens in October, a month later. Uh, Macintosh. Macintosh is in the parentage of liberty. You can taste it once you bite one. Yeah, peaches. Peaches. Peaches should not be at the top of your list of fruits that you uh, want to grow. It can be done. It can be done. It is more challenging. Uh, the issue of disease resistance, there is uh, there's a fruit rot. A, it's called brown rot. Uh, I don't have a picture because it gives me PTSD to just to look at it. That um, you commonly in organic peaches, you can lose 50, even when you're trying, um, you can lose 50% of your crop to brown rot. It has the nasty habit of appearing in your customer's home after they've paid money and brought the peaches home and then, and then, they, then the brown rot happens. You can control it. And I'm gonna go over those controls soon. Um, yes, plums also should not be at the top of your list for the same disease, brown rot. They, they do not have fuzz, uh, which kind of makes them more susceptible to, uh, is, particularly to insect attack. Peach fuzz is a repellent. And, uh, but, but again, peaches can, uh, plums, plums can be done. What do we have next? Oh, okay. So, right, you, you've made a planting. You have trees in the ground. You didn't plant them in a swamp because uh, fruit trees do not like wet, wet, uh, wet feet. If you have, if you're on the wet side, pears can tolerate wet, persimmon, uh, pawpaw. Uh, we, I'm not gonna talk about those last two. Anyways, you have trees in the ground, you better have put on the rabbit guards uh, because rabbits and voles will devour the bark off of young trees. And uh, they'll particularly do it in the winter when there's nothing else to eat, but, but voles can even do it in the summer. Now this tree has a rabbit guard. Last February, we had two feet of snow. It brought the snow right up to the top of the rabbit guard. The rabbits came hopping along and, ha and, and ate the bark off of this tree. The, the top of this tree is dead. Uh, the, the happy ending is you can see there's a couple of little shoots that are coming out that they were under, they've sprouted from under the rabbit guard. So there was protected trunk still behind the, the rabbit guard that has survived and now re-sprouted. I've lost two or three years on that tree, you know, coming to fruition, but it's not dead. When it snows two feet, you invite your friends over to go snowshoeing and, and do snow removal around the trees. You've gotten as far as bloom. You have trees big enough that are flowering. You're, the, 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 in fact, the biggest challenge perhaps in fruit, organic or not, the business of frost and freeze. It is normal for peaches, Asian pears, and plums to open their flowers when you are still a couple weeks from your last frost date. And, and, so, and so the dance begins. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a freeze night, you know, freeze means the entire air column is below 32, and this is, this is trouble. A frost night, less of a threat. A frost is right at ground level and may not be freezing at six or 10 feet off the ground. Anyway, the Amish build fires throughout their orchard. Open fires are illegal, illegal in New Jersey. You can get a one night permit through the extension service uh, for open burning on a freeze night. Uh, uh, you got to research that through extension. I don't have the link at my fingertips. Next slide. Or you can do what I do. You row cover trees. Uh, you know, usually on the worst nights, there's also a north wind blowing. Uh, we're getting row cover over 10 foot trees with a wind. A four letter vocabulary is not adequate, but it can be done. Uh, you use a 10-foot PVC pole, it's, it's, a, it's an art form, uh, and, you, and you get it over, and, and, and it helps. Even, even if it goes below freezing under the row cover, 
somehow it, it still gives you protection. Breaking the wind seems to give protection. So, right, get through the freezes. Yeah, you know, uh, in the last five years, we've had at least two of ma major losses due to freeze. Uh, don't plant if, if, you know, uh, I'm in a valley, a shallow river valley, the Musconetcon River Valley, not the ideal spot. It was the only farm I could afford. You've made it through, fr through the frost. Here comes the diseases. This is black knot in plum. Uh, it's a fungus. He, uh, it's, it's one reason to don't, don't jump into plums. But you cut off, just cut them off as they appear, and maybe you can stay ahead of it. Uh, this is a research in process. Next slide. Scab, apple scab. It's, a, it's a cosmetic. It's why I told you to do disease resistance. Uh, it's ugly. It can be controlled. It can be controlled mainly through fertility, you apply foliar feeding and you and with jugs, you buy jugs of beneficial microbes and, and you spray frequently before or after every rain. I, was it? I can't remember if it's before or after. Next slide. Uh, right, uh, these are beautiful and delicious heirloom apples that will get scab. Again, again the issue of disease resistance there are flavors here that will make you think you died and have gone to heaven. But don't jump into heirloom apple until you've planted disease resistant. Next slide. Okay, the world of insects. Uh, plum curculio largely seen as public enemy number one in, uh, in, 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 in conventional and um, organic orchard. Uh, these bumps is uh, they're called stings. Uh, it, it's where the female laid an egg, and there was a little a larva under that bump. Next slide. But the beautiful truth is the damage, the curculio damage, is only of the skin. Like you know, I've surgically removed the the scab. Look, there is no tunneling. There is no browning of that apple flesh. You just, you just, you tell your customers you eat that bump and be happy, and and so so yeah. But there are controls. There are good controls for curculio. Peaches, peaches and plums are also attacked by curculio, and in them it's more serious. The the wound, the 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 puncture wound in peach and plum is the entry point for. Um, for the brown rot disease. Okay, keep going, keep going. Yeah, we're still with our apple, apple problems. Coddling moth, this is the classic caterpillar in your apple. Uh, before I sell uh, my apples, I, you know, I, I grade them all by looking at the bottom. Um, the caterpillar is gone. The caterpillar exited back in midsummer. To, to do the classic myth of find a half a caterpillar in the apple that, because you just ate the other half, you would have to eat them green you know, in mid to late summer. Nonetheless, the damage inside is kind of ugly. It is around the seed cavity. Most people throw their apple away before they would get as far as the curculio damage. Anyway, um, these are candidates for not fresh sales. The one on the bottom, the one on the bottom is less damaged than the one on the top. You know, could you sell the one on the bottom? Not, not a lot of them. Next slide. Right, the controls for some of these problems. Surround, kale and clay uh, on the left there uh, is nothing but clay powder. You mix it into water, you spray it on the trees. It, it gets into the moving parts of the curculio, it gets into their eyes, it gets into their sexual organs, and they are repelled. Um, and they go away. They go, <laughs> yeah, yes, spraying, right. Spraying has, I was hoping to not have to spray much, but I am, I am, this is, I'm now looking to spend $6,000 on a sprayer. No, no, back to spraying. Um, uh, you know, the clay, oh, yeah, oh no, we need to go back one more slide to make a mention of, 
Microethereal Disperse is a sulfur fungicide, OMRI approved. Uh, it can control brown rot in peaches, plums. Um, you gotta you got wash off the yellow out of that peach fuzz. Uh, we'll go over that. And then the Dipel, BT, in the forefront. For the codling moth, they, the codling moth lays its egg on the outside of the apple. The caterpillar eats its way in, the little tiny caterpillar, and that's when it can ingest the BT. Uh, if the caterpillar's gotten into the apple, it's too late, you're not gonna catch it. Next slide, the sprayer, next slide. City blotch, this is, um, this is a cosmetic problem, but it's pretty notable. Uh, most organic apples come off the tree looking like this. And, and you can, with, with a pot scrubber, you know those green scrubbies? If you, if you don't have three and a half acres of, of tree, you can clean them up very quickly and, and make them shine, you know, for, for the backyard. Um, alternatively, next slide. Yeah, if you're doing, if you're going commercial and organic fruit, you're going to want a fruit brusher washer. You know, it, it sprays water and brushes the apples, you know, and, and, and they come out, they come out gleaming. Uh, for five years ago, you could buy this setup right here for 3000 uh, You know, I don't know what it is now. Uh, next slide. Yeah, all right. Um, you know, that's an Amish business. There's no website for AZS Brusher. They're made in Lancaster. This is out of the Nultz Produce Catalog, who, who sells their equipment also. Next slide. Ugly apple. Despite your best organic efforts and controls, if you have followed best practices, you are still going to have a decent percent of ugly apples. You know, uh, I'm, I'm finding, I'm pushing my customer's envelope on what they'll accept in damage and they're accepting more. In fact, this, this was a happy finding in organic fruit that I am able to sell more cosmetic blemish than I would have expected, even at $3 a pound, $2.50 a pound. And it seems like they're, they're recognizing uh, yeah, you, there, there's the other virtue of the fr of the brusher washer, is that even if they have a couple dings on them, if the rest of the apple is shining, it carries the day. Anyway, what? Next slide. Here, the miracle thing that you can do with all your cosmetic or insect damaged apples, Bowman's fruit butters. Uh, a business located somewhere out near past Quakertown, PA. Bring them eight bushels of apples and they will cook it down and make it into applesauce. Uh, to make apple butter or peach butter or pear butter, uh, you need to bring more bushels than that. You got to check with them on what the requirement is, right? The jar that's on the left, I have a thousand jars of applesauce from this year. Uh, that um, 18 ounce jars, you know, they'll sell for six, seven bucks a jar. It, you know, it's an end. So it's a beautiful thing to do with damaged organic fruit. Next slide. Apple harvest. And you, you can get volunteers into the orchard, uh, particularly for harvest. But you're in the orchard, you are standing upright and you are in shade at least half the time. Uh, yeah, unless you're on the top of a 15 foot ladder, which is actually my favorite place to be. Um, but um, anyway, uh, volunteers, it's a happy place to be, uh, at, you know, surrounded by orbs of lusciousness. In Japan, they call it forest bathing, to spend time in a forest. What's next? We, we're almost to questions here. Yeah. Indeed we are. That's all your slides. So uh, let's, uh, we can open up the chat and we probably have a couple of questions in there, I bet. Uh, did it, here, uh, here, wait, here's, here's one thing. Here's one thing I forgot. The, the, and this is really important. The business of fruit thinning. I, I didn't have a slide, so instead I have a live demonstration. This is an Asian pear branch that broke off the tree 
because it had too much fruit on it. And particularly Asian pear and peaches will massively overproduce uh, more fruit than they, than they need and should. And so you might, I consider this one of the most important jobs in the orchard. You must go through, it's usually in the month of June, and uh, make, make the fruit six inches apart uh, is, is a rough guide. You know, I'm gonna give you resources on, on uh, that where you can look this stuff up. Anyway, also in fruit thinning, you remove those that have already been damaged by the plum curculio. Uh, and, and in the case of, of the peaches, you are removing ones that will then be, or rot. So you, that, that's one of the, you know, uh, that's really helpful in, in terms of disease control, but fundamentally you get a bigger fruit, it, it tastes better. If, if you don't thin, and, and this was my biggest problem in this past year, if you don't thin, you get a million fruits that are only this big, nobody is going to pay money for them and they don't taste good. So thinning, very important. Okay, so, questions. What about uh, forest floor? Can you plant other things at the base of these? Can you have flowers, other other? Yes. 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 Right. The the official thing is to have a, a sod amongst your orchard, even under the trees, uh, at least in organic. But um, I planted my rows twenty five feet. Uh, oh, I meant to go out and measure this. Anyway. Plant your rows far apart. For one thing, your trees will surprise you at how much the branches reach towards the middle. At least for your first five years, you could do agroforestry easily. Once you get to production, uh, you better have planted extra wide. You know, I'm already having trouble getting my tractor down my rows on, on trees that I thought were very far apart when I put them in the ground. You prune, you know, you, you just have to, you, you prune, right? Uh, so we can't cover pruning today, but I'll give you resources about that. Questions? Uh, so another one that's come up, uh, can we plant young Asian pears near where very old declining European pears are grown? Yes, yes, not a problem. They, um, uh, they, they, they don't really share a disease. Uh, your European pear, you know, I mentioned apple scab. There is a scab of pear. Some varieties uh, are very susceptible. Again, I, I, I mentioned two that were not. Uh, uh, so don't, maybe don't plant suckle, which is a, a, a kind of a really good eating pear, but, but very susceptible to this apple scab. I've never seen the, the pear, I mean, the pear scab. I've never seen pear scab on Asian pears. Okay. So go for it. Um, what uh, nurseries do you like for for plant material? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, certification wants you to document that you couldn't buy organic uh, nursery stock. That has been the case, although it could be changing any year now. It might maybe it's maybe it's out there now. It's been a few years since uh, we've done much planting. Uh, uh, there's an Adams County nursery. It's a, it's a really big, uh, there's, a, there's a major fruit growing area in central Pennsylvania at Adams County to be sure. Uh, another one called Boyer, uh, where, where you can find interesting selections. You know, there's, there's the catalogs you'll get that are kind of homeowner, Miller, Miller, Starks, um, uh, you can beat their prices, basically. You know, these other, you know, these other places you buy a bundle of 10 and, and the cost goes way down. Uh, so okay. make your own. You, you can buy rootstock onto which you then graft a branch of your desirable species. You, you know, just the way you graft tomatoes. You can save a lot of money that way. You, you know, it's, and, and I've done it. My, my departed guy, Pete has done it. He, uh, you, he, it's fun. It's fun. It's cheap. Uh, Next. Thanks. Phil, Phil just put up a bunch of potential nurseries, uh, but we have one, one more question for you. 
which I guess folks as we'll, we'll be uploading these videos for a later review on our YouTube. So you can go back and check some of the stuff that you, we've talked about, but um, uh, Curculio, I can't know if I can quite say it. Uh, what's the control? What was the, the method to prevent? That, that is the surround kale and clay. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Clay, yeah. Which washes it's, off in the rain if you're not well, careful. Yeah. If you get three layers on, it becomes rain impervious. Uh, and, 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 you know, that sounds kind of easy to do. It's a surprisingly elusive, uh, you know, um, but, but uh, like, you know, if, if you're having intermittent rain and you, 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 you know, you, you only did one coat and then you went off to the potato patch, uh, then, then you lose it and you're back to square one. Anyway. Three coats. Uh, surround has been a bit of a miracle uh, to organic apple production, fruit production. Nice. All right. Well, I guess uh, we are going to just to keep things moving. We're going to wrap things up. So thank you so much for for chatting with us, inviting us to the farm. Are thank we out of time? Are we out of time? We, we are, are out, out of time. time. Okay. So tell tell Amy we send our regards and to. Uh, to Dean and Emily as well. So yeah. thanks for thanks for sharing thanks with us. Much, Mark. Uh, next up, we have um, one of our favorites, the bearded mammal of, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get, make you some extra adjectives oh, here. Uh, Nate, Nate Kleinman. Yeah, you must um, no. So oh. you, you've got some of your own slides and things to share. I do, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so what we're, we're great, happy to have you evolvingly on board as as always experimentally on board even but uh, uh i like adjectives okay i like adjectives <laughs> but um, do do please tell us all that you know about the beach plum i will do my best um yeah and how bad is it going to be growing it out from the seeds that i bought from <laughs> it's actually one of it's actually one of the rare um fruits that you can start from seed and get fruits within three four years all right. Very Not good. bad at all. Maybe I'll make it that long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Let me share my screen here, um, and hope that it's the right one. Um, boom, 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 boom. Uh, one sec. It will. It will appear. Um, That didn't work, but I'll try it again. Oh, do we need to give you permission? Yeah. Well, no, oh, I, okay. I just have too many tabs open, and it didn't. It didn't. It didn't open this one. For you me. have my permission. <laughs> All right, but we're gonna go start at the beginning because that's where these things should start. Um. All right. How's this look? Yay! Excellent. Um. All right, well, uh, my name is Nate Kleinman, as uh, the folks have said. Um, I, think, I think I calculated this is my fifth year in a row uh, presenting at No for New Jersey, and I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm happy to have just joined the board as well. Um, I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Experimental Farm Network, which is a Philadelphia-based nonprofit. I live here in... Um, uh, Salem County, Elmer, New Jersey, in uh, very, very close to the headquarters of the um, Nanticoke Lenny Lenape tribe um, on uh, Nanticoke Lenny Lenape land. Um, I'm going to talk about beach plums today, and uh, I'm going to talk about both um, uh, growing them and also foraging them a bit for folks who are interested in that and who may not have the uh, wherewithal to grow them uh, at any kind of scale. So uh, beach plums uh, look like this, some of them. Um, they are a native species. Um, they live from uh, roughly uh, Virginia, sort of the um, southern part of the eastern shore, the Delmarva Peninsula. All the way up through Maine uh, and and uh, apparently into the maritime provinces of Canada a bit, maybe New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. I'm not exactly sure. 
how far north they go now. Um, and uh, they live in sand dunes. Um, they are well adapted to the sand dunes on the Atlantic coast. Um, this is uh, this is some that I, I harvested. As you can see from this, um, the fruits can be very, very um, diverse. There's uh, most commonly they are purple. Um, they also have some red reddish ones and uh, and some of these golden yellow ones. Um, they grow on a shrubby, uh, shrubby kind of small tree. If they're well grown and um, trained properly, they can grow to about 18 feet tall. Uh, but most of them uh, that you find in the wild tend to be much smaller than that. And, um, and because there's so much diversity, even when you bring them in uh, into cultivation, if you have a, a diverse stock of them, they are um, there are you, you'll find that there's not um, there's a whole amount of diversity in this the the height, the style of growth. Some of them are much more prostrate. Some of them are much more upright. Um, and uh, this is a this is one that I have growing uh, here in South Jersey that has these uh, beautiful golden, uh, golden color. Um, beach plums have a, uh, most of the beach plum culture that exists out there, people growing them, people foraging them, people making products from them um, is based in um, Cape Cod, but there's also a, a, a growing interest in beach plums in Cape May, uh, which is really the other sort of center of um, beach plum culture. Uh, this th this is an old postcard from Cape Cod, and it's got a little recipe up in the top left for beach plum jelly, which is add seven eighths of a cup of cold water to each pound of ripe and partially ripe fruit, which has been washed, bring to a boil, crush and cook for 30 minutes, strain through cheesecloth overnight, add one cup sugar to keep to each cup of juice, and boil hard to 222 degrees, skim, pour into sterilized jelly glasses and paraffin at once. Um, beach plum jelly is fantastic. The average beach plum has a has sort of a tart flavor, um, so adding sugar is a is really wonderful way to to deal with it. Um, some of them are naturally much sweeter, and some of them even have some bitter taste. So if when you're out foraging, you want to keep an eye out for the bitter ones and don't uh, you want to really taste one or two from every bush that you're foraging from. So that you don't end up getting uh, getting some bitter ones, and the same goes for cultivating them. But I, I'll explain a bit more about what uh, cultivating them is like. Um, this is another old postcard: the beach plums in bloom in Cape Cod, and then the picture of the fruit. Um, the The average beach plum is smaller than a cherry. These are small uh, wild fruit. Um, but the maybe the biggest ones might be about the size of a small cherry, uh, maybe a, a bigger than a tart cherry, but smaller than a Bing type cherry. So why should you grow beach plums? Um, well, I have a pro column here and a con column and then some other uses. Um, on the pro side, they are delicious. Um, they're, they're really good right off the bush, most of them, um, especially if you like something a little tart. Uh, they are nutritious, really high in vitamin C and other minerals. Um, it's a versatile crop. You can use it for a range of things. Um, I'll, I'll go through a, a little bit later and show you some of those products. It's a native species, so it is. Uh, it belongs in this part of the world, and um, it is. Uh, it is adapted to the uh, to the pest and disease pressure that exists in this part of the world, and. Um, and it is also a really good plant for native pollinators and uh, and beneficial insects. So uh, it's definitely if you're if you're really into the natives, um, it's the perfect fruit to add to your landscape because all the other uh, so many of the other um, common fruits that people grow on farms are non-native. Uh, beach plums are easy to grow. Uh, they because they are from uh, because they're adapted to sand dunes. They'll really tolerate um a lot of different uh, a lot of different um kinds of environments um they do prefer well-drained soil so um 
if you have a if you have some really wet spots, that's not where you want to put your beach plums. Um, but they're very adaptable in typical uh, typical garden soil, and in general, they will actually do better once they're uh, once they're removed from from the dune environment and and put into your garden or, or to your farm. Um, uh, beach plums are affordable. Um, you because they grow easily from seed and also from cuttings. Um, it's not. Uh, it, it, it's a. It's a relatively cheap plant to start, uh, and I'll. I'll mention a source later in the in the talk um, that sells beach plums at uh, at a very very reasonable price of a uh, dollar or dollar fifty or two dollars per tree uh, for for one to two year old trees. Um, they are precocious, as I as I said. That means they bear early. Um, they, they can start producing fruit after just uh, a real, sometimes as early as two years, um, but more, more likely three or four. And by five years, um, they're producing a, a solid amount of food. And uh, it's also a beautiful plant. As you saw, the, the flowers um, are really, really lovely, like any, any of the other uh, flowering plants in the prunus um, genus, like cherries or plums or peaches. Um, a con, which uh, which I, I thought about also putting in the pro column, is the variability. Um, but if you're if you're growing beach plums uh, at scale, the variability, and and if you're starting with uh, non-named cultivars, if you're starting with wild material, um, you're going to end up with plants that are not worth growing. Um, if you grow from seed or if you grow from a nursery that is producing them from seed or from, from uh, wild plants, uh, you will find some that are not, uh, that don't produce very well, that don't produce very much. Um, some that are uneven bearers, they won't produce every year um, or, uh, or ones that taste bad. Um, but uh, it, it's, um, it's also, that's also, the variability can be a plus because there's um, there's a lot that can be done with this with this crop. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. As um, I, I mentioned, the experimental farm network we do um, we do plant breeding work, and we're working on developing uh, new varieties of beach plums. And um, I think there's a lot of potential with this with this fruit. There there has not been a lot of work done. Um, New Jersey is one of the only places, really, New Jersey. In Massachusetts and a tiny bit in Michigan um, because of uh, Oikos tree crops, which uh, is no longer doing commercial business. Um, there's really been very little, uh, very little breeding work done. So that variability comes in handy when you're when you're breeding. Um, you've got a, a wide genetic base to start with, and um, I'm particularly interested in the golden beech plums because. Uh, it seems like that's what most people are interested in. Um, the, the purple ones are, are fantastic. They all taste great, um, but there is, uh, there is something really enticing about those golden ones. And uh, when I, whenever I posted pictures and said, hey, would you, would you buy seeds separately if we sold the golden ones? People are very excited about the prospect of uh, having golden, golden beach plum seeds. Um, another con is that it is a small fruit. So it is, um, it's a little bit fiddly to pick. Uh, it requires, um, you know, it requires a, a lot more time and labor than some larger fruit to get, uh, to get the same amount. Um, but uh, it's, it really is well suited to processing. Um, and that's, uh, and, and so the size of the fruit doesn't matter as much. It's not something um, most, most people who grow it are not ever going to sell it at a farmer's market or sell it for fresh eating. Um, uh, it doesn't keep very long unrefrigerated because when you pull it off, you're likely to rip it open at the top. So they don't, they don't keep too long um, for market, uh, but they do keep plenty long to process. And if you put them in the fridge, uh, they'll, they'll stay usable for two, three, even four weeks. Um, Another con is that, uh, like other members of the prunus family, the uh, pits and leaves are toxic. Uh, it contains um, it contains cyanide essentially. Uh, so if you have livestock around, 
Um, you do not want them to get into your beach plum patch. Um, and uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the pits aren't gonna hurt a person unless you make it a habit of crunching them open um, and eating the pit inside, but I don't know many people who ever do that with things like cherries or peaches or plums that also have the same uh, same issue. Um, other uses for beach plums are our habitat for food and wildlife. Great for wildlife plots if you're a hunter. Um, it's uh, also great for dune stabilization. Um, that's one of the one of the primary uses. There's a there's even a cultivar or two that that exist that were developed um, uh, specifically for dune stabilization, and um, that's obviously something that's going to be increasingly important um, as we move into the future with with climate change and increasing uh, increasing severity of storms, and then also uh, roadside stabilization um, because they are salt tolerant, they grow in sand dunes, they can handle all the road salt that we dump on uh, our roads this time of year. Although I'm hoping that we figure out a way to stop doing that because uh, yeah, it's really bad. Um, it's, we're, we're getting salty water in our aquifers. Um, so this is, a, this is a little booklet. There's, there has not been very much published about beach plum, beach plum culture. Uh, but I found this online from the uh, Cooperative Extension Service of uh, UMass. Prob I'm guessing from the graphics here that this is from the 60s or 70s. Um, and uh, I, I, it, it's a very small pamphlet. I've copied and included the entire uh, thing here. So uh, I can make this um, PowerPoint available afterwards if folks want to uh, want to take a closer look at it. Um, and, uh, but it, I, I, it was particularly interesting for the, uh, for this part about the pests. Um, as I said, because it's native, there are not a ton of pests that cause it, uh, cause it big problems, but some of the same pests on, on other plums can be an issue, um, with beach plums. The plum, plum curculio, again, uh, is an issue. It's, um, it's really not as it's not as big of a problem as it is for um, for plums and peaches and and the crops that really need to look pretty to be marketable because beach plums are uh, mostly are going to end up being processed into jam or jelly or wine or other products. Um, if there's some insect damage, it's not uh, it's it's not a huge deal. Um, but the the issue is that brown rot. If if uh, if they get brown rotted and you have a, a large proportion of them uh, that get harvested that have brown rot, then you have some problems. Um, but uh, I generally harvest the ones that I'm growing by hand, and um, it's easy enough to just not pick the ones that have some brown rot on them. But overall, I haven't noticed a, a large problem. Um, we have about 70 plants going um, here in Elmer, and they are. Um, there's really very few of them are uh, have really been affected by by some of these um, pests and diseases. Um, they are they uh, sometimes can be susceptible to black knot fungus, which you may see on um, cultivated plums. You'll often see it on wild cherries uh, all over the place, um, and that could be uh, that could be a bit treacherous. Uh, plum pocket is uh, is also an issue. This picture though. Um, on the top left is actually on a, those are on uh, probably European plums. Um, so they couldn't even get a, they couldn't even really get a picture um, of, uh, I, I think that's what we're looking at. Yeah, they couldn't get a picture of, of beach plums with it. Um, but brown rot, you can see on the left, ends up with these sort of mummies, they call them. Um, and the, the fungus lives over the winter in those rotten fruit and then, um, and then helps to spread. So uh, it is beneficial to get rid of any that, you've, that you find, get them out of the field, um, and uh, that, will, that will help out with this disease pressure. But overall, I, I have not had many problems with, uh, with pests and diseases. This is sort of uh, what the average, uh, beach plum harvest I get looks like this was from one or two bushes that were all purple. 
Um, and you can see there's maybe a few, uh, a few that don't look so good, but overall these are fine and this will make delicious jam. That, in fact, it did make delicious, delicious jam. Um, this is uh, this is a picture of the field where where I grow in um, here in uh, Pittsgrove Township. The uh, beach plums. I don't know if you can see my arrow on the screen, but uh, this this area, these three rows, are where the beach plums are growing, um, and they're really they're really doing fine. I just put included this so you can see that they're quite far away from any sand dunes. Um, we have somewhat sandy soil, but really. It's a loam down here, and uh, and they're doing just fine. Um, we do have we do use the pond on the left corner for irrigation. Sometimes we string a we have a solar panel and we string um, a hose up to the top of the hill in the middle, a, a slight rise in the middle of the field, and then have um, uh, drip irrigation. But uh, I have never um, I have never irrigated the beach plums. They just don't need it. Um, so just for a little size comparison, this is uh, these are American plums, which are uh, closer in size to plums you might buy at, at the store. They're, they're also smaller though. The pink ones there are the American plums. And then on the left, the little, little looking like berries are the beach plums. Um, and then as I mentioned, the variability. Um, so this is a this is a golden beach plum bush uh, that is has very sparse uh, fruiting on it um, because it's golden. I haven't ripped that plant up yet um, because there aren't there just aren't that many that are golden. On, of of our seventy, there's probably four or five that are golden or sort of green gold, um, and only one of them is really. Uh, productive enough to be worthwhile, um, and we might start uh, propagating that one and maybe maybe put a name on it. Um, this is a productive purple one, so you can see the difference between this unproductive one and this uh, highly productive one. Um, this this plant has really great flavor and um, really great uh, really great fruit, so chances are that's that's one we're going to. Uh, we're going to want to keep all the ones that we have are are unnamed um, wild material that we got from a, from a nursery. We we started uh, the, the, from Ackerboom Nursery, which um, I'll, I'll I have a slide about later to, to uh, with the information if anybody wants to get their own trees from them. Um, and this is another one. This one has um, these fruits. It's hard to tell, but they're smaller and um, they're also paler, and they are um, much more sour in flavor. Uh, but I kind of like having a mixture of the flavors for for various uh, applications. It's useful to have a mix of the strongly flavored sour ones, the strongly flavored sweet ones, uh, maybe the juicier, not as flavorful ones, um, because when you mix them all together, it, it, it adds a real richness to whatever you're making. Um, and you can see this is just some of the some of the diversity uh, of the plants that are um, growing here in Elmer. Uh, a little bit more, um, and that was all. Uh, that was all the golden ones from uh, the really nice bush. Those are nice sized fruit, real clean, um, and really tasty. Uh, so there's there's a little bit of a sense of what what they look like at our field. This is after about five years. They are um, about five feet tall. Uh, behind it is a um, is a, a, a hardy northern pecan. So I'm sort of growing them as an understory tree underneath the the, the pecans, and they are uh, they really thriving uh, in that environment. Uh, we did put them in one of the um, in one of the uh, least fertile parts of the field, a place where uh, annual plants have struggled. Um, it's, it's sandier soil there and um, really just not very fertile soil. Um, and they've, they've, done, um, they've done really well there. Uh, the few that we planted in richer parts of the soil, parts of the farm ha have done even better. They're growing even taller, they're more productive. Um, but these are doing well in a place where 
few other things are really doing well. Um, we have done a bit of alley cropping, uh, growing some, some other crops in between them, um, but they've gotten to the point where we, we did sort of tight rows um, where there's not really much more space for alley cropping. Um, this is another one that's sort of uh, sparse. This is actually still growing in a pot that I didn't plant. Um, so I mentioned the cultivars. These are some of the cultivars that, that you might be able to find somewhere. Um, Bassett's American was the first cultivar selected for larger fruit here in New Jersey in the 1940s. There's uh, another, there's uh, some other early ones were East Ham from Massachusetts, Squib Knocket from New Jersey, which I would really like to get my hands on just for the name. Um, Hancock is one of the most popular uh, that has larger fruit and real good taste. Safford as well, large yield, sweet fruit. Um, Autumn and Snow were both selected in Massachusetts for reliable annual fruiting. As I mentioned, some of these beach plums are not annual bearers. Um, and it, it can be real unpredictable. Um, with the wild populations, sometimes um, uh, none of them will flower, none of them will fruit in a year. And it's usually due to a really late frost um, or it may have something to do with, uh, with the pollinator populations. Um, there's still research that needs to be done, but again, not a lot of people have been doing it. So, um, you know, we need, we need to learn some more about these plants and why they do that. But there are some that are much more reliable annual bearers. And that's part of what we're evaluating with the 70 plants we have going here in, in, um, in Elmer and with uh, additional seedlings that we're, that we're uh, starting. Um, Putnam is another one with larger fruit from Massachusetts. Um, Rarabank is a New Jersey variety that is resistant to brown rot and Japanese beetles. That's a really valuable, um, those are two very valuable traits. Uh, I mentioned again that the um, Ocean View variety, which was, um, which was developed by a, a consortium of agriculture departments, I believe in New Jersey, Delaware, and Massachusetts, is, um, was developed specifically for dune stabilization and coastal restoration. As I understand it, it has the prostrate form and um, when beach plums have that prostrate form, they hit the ground and uh, will root again from the ground. So they'll end up with this real creeping form and they can produce large thickets, uh, which I'll I have a picture of later that I'll show you. Um, I mentioned Oikos tree crops in, in, um, in Michigan, which is, uh, um, that's Kenny Asmus's company, which doesn't exist as of this year, um, but Kenny still has a lot of the, a lot of his genetics and, um, that stuff's not going to disappear. I think it's still going to be available, but he was selling seeds from that Nana um, cultivar, which is a dwarf cultivar, has a spur bearing fruit habit and high production. Um, and then Ecos uh, was selected for yield, fruit quality and disease resistance. And then the most recent addition to the, uh, to the pantheon of beach plum cultivars is the Rutgers Jersey Gems. Which, is, um, which was released in 2017. This was part of a breeding project um, led by Jenny Carlio. And um, uh, I believe that she, she has left Rutgers and I don't believe that anybody has picked up this, but I may be, I may be wrong. Um, it's an annual bearer of sweet, large fruit. Um, it is uh, uh, the, I've, I've, almost got my hands on some of these, but I, I balked at the end because they wanted, um, they wanted me to sign an uh, a MTA materials transfer agreement that said that I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't distribute um, seeds from it or something, I think. And so I ended up not getting it because anything that I get, I'm going to uh, distribute seeds from. Um, but I am, if they ever change that policy, I'll be happy to try that one too. Uh, as I understand it, though, it's not particularly superior to um, some of these other uh, other varieties. But um, they found it and they were excited about it, so they um, they gave it a name and and uh, released it. Um, this is some beach plum jam that I made this past summer. I actually brought the fruit with me in buckets uh, and um, brought it up uh, on a trip to Maine and processed it there. I hadn't had time to deal with it when I was here in Jersey. 
Um, but you can see that the, the one in the middle was from just the golden fruit and, um, and the other two were, uh, were the other three jars there were purple. Um, this is the process of making some jam actually at an Airbnb on an, another trip over the summer. Um, what you, uh, the best thing to do is use some hardware cloth to, um, to clean the, uh, um, to clean the pits out of the seeds and get the pulp out. You can also just um, mash them up with your hands and then um, filter it out. I'm, because I'm trying to save the seeds without boiling them, um, I, 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 you know, sell the seeds. Um, I, I have to take extra care, but if you, if you are not worried about that, you can mash the seeds up and um, you can, you can uh, separate it more easily. You can, you can, once you start to cook it, the flesh will fall out and then you can strain out the pulp and, uh, and separate the seeds that way. Um, I made one batch that was, uh, that was overcooked, at least I thought. And then it turned out that it made this really delicious, um, almost caramelized uh, jam that was super sweet and uh, just had a fantastic flavor. It reminded me of um, in uh, in Iceland they they take rhubarb and uh, make a caramelized rhubarb jam, and it was very similar in flavor um, to that. Although without that rhubarb taste, it was all it was all beach plum, but really really excellent. I think there's there's a lot of potential that hasn't even been explored in commercializing this uh, um, this really cool native plant. Um, there are people who are doing that. One of them is uh, Jalma Farm, which is in, in New Jersey. Um, they make a beach plum jam and also make this uh, Aronia jam. Um, there are uh, Terhune. I don't know if they're still making beach plum jelly. Um, up in Cape Cod, if you go into any little souvenir store up in, in Provincetown or uh, elsewhere in Cape Cod, you will find um, you'll find beach plum jams. There are more people bottling, um, canning beach plums up in uh, Cape Cod than there are in New Jersey. They just have a bit more habitat up there. Um, you know, so many of the so many of the dunes in New Jersey were long ago bulldozed to put uh to put houses on um so the the uh, remaining habitat here is um is, is is more sparse but where you find them uh you can find a ton of beach plums and i'll talk a bit more about that uh at the end which we're getting to um this is the uh this uh natali vineyards makes beach plum wine they also make an aronia wine. They told me once that the that I think a third or a quarter of their and all their aronia wine goes to the Philadelphia Eagles trainer, who makes the Philadelphia Eagles uh, football team drink it for its antioxidant effects. Um, but the beach plum wine is really really interesting, really um, really cool flavor. Um, there, someone is making a beach plum rum. Uh, someone else is making a beach plum gin. Um, there's real, there, there's just a, a whole lot of excitement about this plant. Um, one thing that's an old recipe that's pretty exciting is a, is a shrub, which is uh, a vinegar, vinegar based drink. Peach plum makes great, uh, great vinegar, uh, great drinks. I actually have, um, I turned all that golden plum uh, juice into vinegar that I have in the other room. Um, and there's a there's a cool book called Plum Crazy, a book about beach plums, which uh, I think I have on my shelf here somewhere too. But I've got this picture online, and um, this book was published in 1973. And there's a recipe in there for beach plum shrub, uh, which basically involves mixing beach plum juice with apple cider or apple cider vinegar and uh, some sugar. Um, here's uh, here's from a you know and probably an hour of of uh, harvesting maybe half an hour got a big old basket full over the summer um so then um getting onto the foraging where are you going to find beach plums i'm also going to say where you find them to buy them uh and to produce them for your farm but um they they grow in dunes um the picture on the right th these are beach plums these most of these sprawling plants in in the foreground are beach plums um, 
these are some of the associates that you might find with beach plums. So if you see beach peas and American persimmons and Northern bayberry growing in a, uh, in a sand dune, chances are there might be beach plums around. Um, you also want to keep an eye out for poison ivy. Poison ivy also likes to grow in this habitat. Um, so um, do, do keep an eye out. Um, this, is, uh, this is another great habitat for beach plums. This is uh, sand dunes at uh, Cape May Point. Um, another, this is also by there, by Cape May Point. Um, just give you a, a few dune pictures. Uh, but here again, this is sort of what they look like. You can see the roots coming out. You can see how these sprawl around. And it's often hard to tell which plant is which until, uh, unless you're there when they're all fruiting, because you can see, you'll notice the fruit from one plant all look the same and the plant next to it look different. Uh, and so if you see chunks of uh, plant that are all near each other, you can say, oh, okay, that's the same plant, even though it's maybe gone underground for a few feet and then come back up somewhere else. Um, but uh, really easy plant to forage for when you know where to find them and if you, uh, if you get there before other folks. Um, this is some, you can see those are, uh, those are American persimmons uh, in the background and then that's uh, some beach plums in the foreground. That's along the bay side in Cape May. Uh, and here's a place where there are, you can see the grass on the left. This is a dune uh, a managed dune on, on Cape May along the Delaware Bay. And, uh, and then that's a beach plum plant growing right there. Um, once you get a, uh, it really pays to know what the leaves look like if you're trying to find them in the off season or if you happen to go there when they should be uh, producing fruit, but it's a year when there aren't any fruiting. Uh, they have, uh, the, the stem has um, these little bumps on it. Those are called lenticles. And uh, that's um, a lot of other plants in the Prunus genus look the same. Um, you can also recognize them by the flowers. If you, if you go there in the spring, it's a lot, it's very easy to spot them because of these, uh, because of the bright white flowers. And then you can go back in the, um, in August and September when they're fruiting and, uh, and harvest them. As you can see, the bumblebee was very happy to find these beach plums. Um, and then this is what it looks like when you find them. Um, another place that you might access them if you're interested in doing breeding work uh, or want to um, want to get as much diversity as possible for your planting. This is it actually in Connecticut at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, this whole patch in the back left is a beach plum plantation. Uh, it was a research plot that was put in many years ago, but is no longer um, no longer used as far as I understand it. So um, if you can get in touch with them and get permission to go on there, they will let you forage for beach plums for the fruit. They will let you take cuttings, um, uh, evaluate what's going on there, whatever you like. And uh, as I said, they're, they're pretty mature. So these are some big uh, plantings. That's my friend Eliza there. Um, these are some of them close up of some of the fruits there. They have some of the named cultivars as I understand it, um, but they are not labeled. You'd have to get a map. Um, I mentioned earlier Ackerboom Nurseries in Cedarville down here near me in Cumberland County. Um, they sell all sorts of different trees. Uh, you wanna write down that number, you wanna write down that website, ackerboom.com. Um, Really, that's this is a really invaluable source for a whole range of native and non-native um, nursery trees, woody crops. Um, I uh, I circled a portion of their price list here. Um, you can see they have currently have nine thousand beach plums in stock, and they're selling the twelve to eighteen inch ones for a dollar fifty a piece, and eighteen to twenty four inch for two dollars a piece, which I believe is quite a reasonable price. These are bare root dormant trees. They're in refrigeration right now. Um, and uh, most of their clients are, are people doing, you know, highway departments and, and uh, road departments who are, uh, want native plants for, for those purposes. Um, we are, uh, Experimental Farm Network is selling beach plum seeds. Uh, there's a few other sources out there for beach plum seeds, but I don't know 
where they get their seeds. Um, we're selling a mix of golden and purple ones this year. Hopefully next year we'll, we'll sell just the golden ones as well. And um, this is what the seeds look like from my select K May Beach plums. Um, and one of the, re one of the um, reasons why I would recommend if people are grow wanna grow them for, for farm use, grow them from seed. Um, I, I know this is a shameless plug, but we're, as far as I know, we're the only folks out there who are selling selected Cape May beach plums, selected beach plums at all. The, the seeds that we are selling come only from plants that taste good. Uh, while, um, like I said, if you're harvesting from the wild and you just wanna get as many seeds as possible to sell, you're gonna end up with a lot of seeds that taste uh, from, from plants that taste terrible. Uh, it's, probably, it's probably only 20% um, really taste bad, but uh, yeah, if you're, if you're trying to select and breed for, breed for um, good, good tasting plants, you wanna start with ones that, that taste good. Um, and uh, we urge folks to join our breeding project as well. This is our main website, experimentalfarmnetwork.org. And um, where we where we um, post projects and anybody can join and create a, a breeding or research project themselves. Um, and there you can see the Beach Plum Improvement Project. You can join the project, and then um, at some point down the road, I will I will be in touch. And really, it's just a place for people to share um, any any good results they're having from growing seeds or growing um, uh, or really any work that they're doing with beach plums. So um, that is the talk. Uh, there's our website at the bottom. If you uh, send an email through that, it goes to my inbox. So um, you can get in touch with me there. And um, really, really uh, happy to be here. I, I, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if I'm happy to answer we some. Got, if we got at least four minutes, maybe Great. three and a half. So um, we, we do have a handful of questions. Um, the erratic nature, they're not always gonna fruit. Not all these varieties are always gonna fruit. Is that accurate? Yeah, um, but although I have to say, I think it's more, uh, in my experience, this is more of a problem with the wild populations so okay. far. And it may, be, it may really have to do with the pollinator. Uh, like I said, we're not really sure. I've been growing them now for five or six years and we have yet to have a year where they do not produce for us. So okay. I don't know if that's gonna continue, but uh, so far we've had good luck. And some of those years have been years when the wild populations have not produced anything. Okay. Um, do you do you thin it all? Do you prune or or pluck fruit, or you just let them go? Um, I I mostly just let them go. Um, but it is wise to do some pruning to prune out the uh, inner core to give them some room to grow, and um, and also just to be able to reach the fruit because they can form pretty dense. Um, dense thickets among themselves and um, it's hard to just get your hands in there. So doing a little bit of pruning is, uh, is beneficial. And if you really train them, um, you, can, you can get a tree-like form. Um, and they also, they also do send up suckers sometimes. So you, can, uh, you wanna keep an eye on that, cut down the suckers if you, if you don't want them. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question also in the chat that came to me directly from Charlie. Do I think they'll do okay in heavy clay soil? Um, I think it's worth a tr it's worth a try. Um, if it's well drained, I think they'll do better. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, on the disease pressure front, um, surround could surround be used on them to keep some of those those insects away. Yeah, I think surround would be would be the best choice. That that uh, cowlin clay. I yeah. haven't used it at all. I have never used any any treatment on ours. And uh, I really, it really hasn't been a problem. Our losses from pests have not been so great that I've wanted to do anything. So, uh, you know, it's if, if I lose 5% to uh, brown rot and plum curculio combo, that's, you know, cost of doing business. Okay. Um, and and bird, bird pressure, is that an issue? The birds don't seem very interested in them. We have plenty of other stuff for them to eat. So they, they've, they've left it alone, but I, I think they probably... I think they probably are munching on it, but it, I haven't noticed a problem. Okay. Um, you still, I was going to use that question, but I was going to. <laughs> you stole my I, question. I talk more than. But I, I was going to, I was going to refer to it as a like Austin Tower. Do the birds really love beach plums? Um, anyway, <laughs> no. no, darn, that's right. <laughs> 
Um, Tony always throws a little bit more flair into uh, these things than I do. I'm a clown first, so what do I do? Oh, clown um, first. How about a uh, average size? You know, the, everybody wonders what's the average size. Um, it's about the size of a nickel. Okay. 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 Some and, of them more like a dime, though. Okay. Little, they're little, little, real, like blue, real, blueberry size. Yeah, real good one is the size of a quarter. Wow. Okay. Even bigger though. Um, yeah. And the height of its shrub. Sorry, they're coming in real quick. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, like I said, they can grow as high as eight feet, but I think the, uh, 18 feet, but I think the average, you know, is probably, probably five or six feet. The ones I see in the wild are rarely much taller than me. They might be, I've seen maybe seven, eight foot tall plants in the wild. Um, but most of them are, um, most of them are, are, you know, two, three feet off the ground in, in their natural habitat. Okay. All right. Well, we better let you go. So we've got time for our, our last fruity speaker. Uh, Meg, um, we might have to let people pee. Yeah, we, we probably better take a, a five minute break um, and come back promptly because